Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So there are two things you should do when you're about to give a talk. Drink lots of caffeine, not use the bathroom, and eat food. I've done none of those things, so I'm really excited to get going. <laughs> uh, Clicking. Hi, I am Charlotte. I'm Charlotte Tiz. If you want to tweet about me, feel free, but my pronouns are they and them. Um, I am super queer, super trans. I'm very loud about it. If you're wondering about Kane, I got this through smashing the patriarchy. <laughs> 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 I'm a developer at Usage, been there for a few months. Um, really cool, really good stuff. I think we're hiring, blah, blah, blah. I don't really care about that. So, um, I'm a core contributor to Fiddy, which is an offline first JavaScript framework, which tries to make uh, people who aren't so good at front end have an easier time building their first app. And I am an admin of Wheel.js, which is what I like to think as an inclusive Slack community where people uh, such as minorities and such should have the space to learn in a nice way. All of these things involve open source, so I should probably define what that is before I go on. Open source is software that can be freely used, changed, and shared in modified or unmodified form by anyone. Which is a great definition I fundamentally disagree with because I do not believe that open source is accessible to everyone. A lot of people who contribute to open source uh, tend to be cis white men who have the time, energy, an internet connection, whether fast or you know even on a on a two G in the middle of nowhere, still better than what some have. Little experience of harassment uh, and employment, so it's quite hard to spend the time contributing to open source when you're desperately looking for a job. It's quite a negative view of open source, but I'm here to tell you that we can make it better. So I'm going to outline five things that I can do with our open source projects to make them more accessible and inclusive. Um, I'm kind of probably preaching to the choir here because a lot of these people do these things. I'm going to do an eight minute diatribe on codes of conduct and you've already all signed one, you know what they are. But it's always good to outline why they're good to have. So codes of conduct, which I think is the most important document that you'll have in your project. Code of conduct is, uh, for example, a document that will sit in your GitHub repository that outlines what is and is an acceptable behaviour within your project. Uh, there was a, not, it hasn't happened in 2017 that I'm aware of yet, but it's still early days, but there was a lot of uh, furor over codes of conduct in 2016. A lot of well-known projects that I won't name uh, said, well, what about my free speech? This is code. I should be able to do what I want and say what I want. Um, that's a much longer talk, which I don't really have the energy or the care to talk about. Um, the TLDR is, if your free speech is actively harming somebody in my project, you can get the hell out. Code of conduct isn't a catch-all though, so if I have a code of conduct, it doesn't mean that, oh wow, everyone's going to be really nice and lovely to each other, what a great time I'm having in this open source project. Rather, it's a pledge by project maintainers to do the best to ensure the safety of their contributors and their fellow maintainers. My favourite code of conduct for GitHub repositories, another open source project, is we all contribute. A little bit biased because I did help actually create this one. Um, but it's currently, well, it's just been released as a node package, which will be continuously updated, so you can even have some help updating your code of conduct. And for events and stuff, uh, I like Conf Code of Conduct. It needs a little bit of work, but it's a good starter if you've never had a code of conduct before for your events. So get a code of conduct. Um, really, get a code of conduct, it's 2017, you should have one. <laughs> but make sure that you read it first, because there's no point having a document that you don't actually know what it contains. And a lot of people don't read their code of conduct. They copy and paste and contribute to public and we all contribute to the code of conduct, say, oh, I've done the need for now, now people buy tickets to my event. It's not how it works. Make sure to keep it updated as well. There are a lot of people who do that copy and paste job, they understand what they're signing up to, but they'll let it sit there for three years. And if you're using a code of conduct that is an open source project, that code of conduct will be continuously updated. So you should treat it as you would treat a node module. When you look at your node modules to worry about security issues, you should be looking at your code of conduct to make sure that it's protecting the largest amount of people that you can. If you're going to have a code of conduct, you should be prepared to deal with problematic behavior. It's worse to have a code of conduct that you're not going to enforce than not having a code of conduct at all. I'd rather know where the, uh, where the project stands without having one than be lulled into a full sense of security, something bad happens, and then the maintainers go, well, maybe you could be a bit nicer? It doesn't work like that. 
reason why I like the Wheel JS code of conduct so much is that it has a really large and robust section on enforcement policy. And there are just like, three key points that I like about our enforcement policy that I wanted to talk about here. First of all, uh, what about my free speech and I hate code of conduct people? <coughs> we all mess up. Uh, not everything that happens, everything that happens can be treated differently, it's a case by case scenario. If you say one bad thing, I'm not going to say, well, you're not allowed to do any code forever now. I'm going to take that and we're going to work together to solve the issue. Safety of the hurt takes priority. If you come to me with a complaint, then I'm going to deal with you because you're more important than the person who's done the harm. And lastly, we promise support, not safety. If you come into my project, I can't guarantee that everything's going to be really good. Something will happen, and that's what I want to get across to people who do events selling. Something will always happen. I can guarantee something has happened at every single event that you've been to. You just don't know about it. I will do my best to protect you, but I can't guarantee that nothing's going to happen. Uh, when I wrote this talk, it was about a year ago, and there was this person called Ash Dryden who I thought was really <laughs> And had this really good 101 and FAQ. So uh, Ash did some really good writing on codes of conduct. So if I haven't convinced you, they have a much longer piece where they talk about what a code of conduct is, why a code of conduct exists, how to enforce it, etc. It's, it's a really good piece, so please do have a look at it. The second most important document in your project is the readme. This is the first thing that you see when you go to someone's project. And it, it might be something like this. So, welcome to Unicorn JS, home of the Unicorn Writing CLI tool. To use it, install Node, make sure that you have NPM, install the Unicorn, and then write the Unicorn. <laughs> this is a good primer for a basic project that you don't really want anybody to touch. <laughs> but there is so much more that we can provide to people. Um, I say that this is to help other people, but it's also to help you because the less issues that you have to deal with, the more likely you're actually going to like working on your project. So, type of project. Welcome to Unicorn JS, home of the Unicorn Writing Tool. Here's our code of conduct. Anything that you do with Unicorn JS is subject to our code of conduct, and we expect you to behave appropriately. To install it, make sure that you have Node, make sure that you have NPM, and then NPM install Unicorn, write the Unicorn. But if you want to go in more in depth, here are some books, tutorials, videos, etc., to get more experience with Unicorn JS. You're going to get stuck, so when you get stuck, check us out on Slack, IRC, Gitter, whatever weird communication tool that we're using, or you can log up GitHub issue. Here's how you file a GitHub issue. Please stick to the template because that will help us triage your issue much quicker and it will give everybody a nice time. Security issues are completely different now, so if you could email us at unicornwriting at gmail.com, that would be really appreciated. We're an open source project, so we really need your help. And 2.0 Unicorn.js is shipping an all terrain unicorn. Here are some issues that you can help me with so we can get that shipped. And lastly, if none of this applies to you, or you have a different question, or you're just a little bit shy, then email me at unicorn at gmail.com, and then we can have a good time together. I briefly mentioned GitHub issues there, so I want to touch upon that a little bit more. I'm the creator of your first PR, which long-time followers will know that it's pretty much dead because I'm exhausted. But when it was alive, it was tweeting GitHub issues that I believe to be approachable for beginners to programming, beginners to open source, or someone who was just looking for something to happen on a Friday that didn't take too much effort. Because I believe that open source is a great place to learn. Despite my world-renowned expertise, I've only been programming for about two and a half years, entirely self-taught, and the first, one of the first things I did was look on GitHub for things I contribute to. I ended up finding this little project called Hoodie, and none of them had English as a first language, so they had some grammatical problems. So I helped them out with that, and then Six months later, I was a core contributor, shaping the community and making sure that it was open to beginners. If you know Hoodie, you know that uh, we have a lot of issues for beginners. We actively take in new contributors by preparing, uh, hand preparing issues that we think that they can fix. Uh, this is the first issue that we have created. It was me. I'm the best. Uh, January 2016, which was a long time ago. The Hoodie website had, and still does, have accessibility problems, uh, just too much for me to tackle with an open source project, so I thought I'd open it up to other people so they could learn how to do accessibility. Because if there's one thing that's true of a lot of developers is that they have no idea what that means. So I explained the 
issue, uh, I give the solution rather than the problem in the title, so you already know what you're looking at without having to click in the issue. So give the hoodie logo meaningful alternative text. In the valve report itself, I explain how you can replicate the issue, and then we do step-by-step -step instructions on how you're going to fix it. From forking the repository to the commit messages that you should use, and if you get stuck, then you're free, feel free to reach out to me on Slack or on Twitter. Labels are your friends too, they're not just there to look at. Uh, I use the bright red bug label, uh, which is convention across GitHub, and even if they turn out to be a big mess, bugs are usually easier or more approachable for beginners to fix rather than a fully fledged feature. So you can hum, come help me fix my accessibility issues, but you might not be ready to ship that all to a unicorn with me. Help wanted, it's always good to be explicit. A lot of people can pop up into GitHub issues saying, here's your solution, I fix it for you. And it's like, well, actually, I wasn't really looking for a fix, I'm just going to do it on my own. So help wanted label really explicitly tells people that you actually seek seeking help. And then lastly, uh, start the issue. We don't use this label anymore in video, but I use it across my other projects. This is to say, hey, if this is your first experience of this project, here's a really good way to get started without touching too much of the code base. Um, and also uh, assume that you might be mentored on issues here as well. So that's GitHub issues, but before we even start writing our readmes and our code conducts and our GitHub issues, we have to think about the language that we use. Uh, you are reaching an audience of many, of many different people from many different walks of life, um, and we need to make sure that we reach the audience. First up, everything that you write should be clearly worded. Just because we know fancy words doesn't mean that we have to use them. The Government Digital Service, thank you to our sponsors, <laughs> recommends writing for a reading age of about nine years old. I might be really good at code, but I might not be able to understand the things that you're writing. To write it simply, there are tools that can help you as well, like Hemingway app, which I rely on to write everything that I do. Um, yeah, keep things simple. Uh, now we've got a favourite topic, if you know me, uh, gender language. So I've already mentioned that tech is dominated by men. Uh, so you'll see a lot of programming examples that don't need this, but they're also assumed that the person that they're explaining to or talking about is a man. So they'll use he and him. That's not very accessible. Uh, so a couple of years ago, people start to be like, Woo, let's use she and her because women exist too. Why was I thinking that's kind of appropriate? Thank you for shrug there. Women do apparently exist. <laughs> um, and I'm not saying this just because these are my pronouns, but they and them is a really good way to speak to someone without assuming anything about them. Similarly, similarly don't ever talk to me in a group and say, hey guys, I will say, not a guy. And I do this every day at work. Um, you may think that, hey guys, gender neutral, I respect your opinion, but I also respect my ability to disagree with it. Uh, half the room might agree with this, half the room might not, so why don't we try and be a little bit more inclusive for the people who don't like being called hey guys? So, note that. Suggest, so hey everyone, hi everybody. Save oh. your response, it's that easy. <laughs> But language is quite hard, so we can use computers to help us. In Hoodie Slack, every time someone says, hey guys, this is usually the first thing. <laughs> my communist. <laughs> um, usually, whenever a new contributor joins Hoodie, and it's not, I would say it's quite a 50 50 split in terms of gender, if you believe in that weird gender binary thing. Um, and they'll say, hey guys, I really like your project. And the first thing that they'll get is, did you mean comrades? Or did you mean everybody? Or something similar like that. And they read, nine times out of 10, they go, oh, I'm really sorry, edit the message. And then we continue the conversation as if nothing happened. It's nice to get Slack to do this because people don't really like being told off by real human beings. <laughs> in, uh, just to touch upon Amos a little bit, in Wheel.js, we have semi-automatic Slack bot responders. So if I come in and I say, oh, that's really crazy, this JavaScript framework is so crazy, then I could be like, well, firstly, a JavaScript project isn't an entity, it's a thing. Uh, but words I can say in crazy are terrible descriptors. It's, you know, I have a variety of mental health issues, and I don't appreciate it when someone says that a JavaScript framework is crazy. So I explain that it's not a good solution, and how about shocking, or amazing, or ridiculous, or wonderful? There are so many better descriptors, and it makes you a better writer as well. How 
really spoken about code in this talk because I believe that in open source, code isn't particularly important. I can write my unicorn module tomorrow, but no one's going to see it without people writing the newsletters, without people doing the design. And I'm not talking about we need designers to do some logos or something because to reduce design work to that is fundamentally wrong. Um, community moderation, who's managing our Slack channels or our GitHub? Who's writing our documentation? Because apparently developers don't like that very much. I think it's the thing. Um, yeah, so all of these things are really important, and people often ignore all these things, but actually this is the core of your open source project and something that we should pay more attention to. We have an editorial team at Vidi. I consider some doing something for your, if your open source project is quite large. Get some people, a dedicated repository of people to actually start looking at those things because it attracts a really big audience. Mm. I'm a programmer, but I actually don't do a lot of open source code. I spend more time writing things and moderating things and, and documenting things because that's what I enjoy. So a lot of people who don't like writing code outside of the office, but all really like doing those sort of things. Um, I'm going to finish now. I'm a little bit over time, uh, under time, rather. Uh, but I wanted to point out my last section, which is that you are important. Burnout is real. I've done it twice, but I feel like I'm doing it every weekend. And without you, there is no open source. So if you need to take naps, if you need to go eat a giant pizza to yourself and cry, do that. Because the open source project will still be there when you get there. Because at the end of the day, this is my vision of open source. A variety of cute, soft animals in hoodies by a campfire, <laughs> discussing how much they enjoyed doing that for their first board press, how much they enjoyed interacting with the open source community. Thank you. I am so honoured to speak at this conference. It may be my last, though everyone who says, every person I say this to says, Charlotte, you said it was your last six months ago, and here you are. This is the most diverse group that I've ever spoken to, which is a shame, because it should be like this every day. And I've also never been signed, I've never been captioned, and I just think that the work that Ash and everybody else here has done is phenomenal. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs>